everyone. We welcome you to the eighth episode of the Scientific Saturday Lecture Series. These lectures are our endeavor to take global science to the students residing even in the remotest corner of the nation. I'm Vishaka Ranjan, founder of Gurukul Academy. And our guest for today is Professor Mansi Kastliwal. She has earned her Bachelor of Science at Cornell University in 2005 and completed her doctoral work in astronomy at Caltech in 2011. After a joint postdoctoral fellowship at Carnegie Observatories and Princeton University, she joined the Caltech faculty in 2015. As principal investigator of growth, which is global relay of observatories watching transient happen, she heads a worldwide network of collaborators who are trying to capture the astrophysics of short-lived energetic uh, transient event to find out more about how they evolve. Welcome, Professor. Hello, everyone. I'm Rishabh Nathra, founder and admin of the Secrets of the Universe. Before we invite Professor Mansi Kasliwal for her lecture, I would like to remind everyone that we'll be taking questions after the presentation. So please post your queries in the comment section and we'll be taking it once the lecture is over. We welcome you, ma'am. We are very fortunate and privileged to have you with us today. Without further ado, we request Professor Mansi Kasliwal to begin this session. All right, a very good morning to all of you. And thank you so much for this opportunity to be part of the Gurukul Academy today and uh, give a lecture. I'm very excited about this. Um, today, I want to tell you about uh, fireworks. Um, so I hope all of you have seen fireworks, maybe on Diwali when you lit some diyas and saw some fireworks, maybe at somebody's wedding you saw some fireworks. So today I want you to imagine fireworks in um, that are in our universe. So cosmic fireworks in galaxies far, far away. And I'm going to share um, what I do, which is basically discover, characterize, and study cosmic fireworks. Hi, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I would like to interrupt. I'm like, uh, I'm intervening. Ma'am, the, the sound problem is coming. The sound is, you know, there's a glitch in the sound, the earlier one. So oh, okay. Just request okay, you on. for the sound. All right. Do you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. I'm sorry. For All right. No, no worries. Let me know if the sound problem comes again. Um, should I repeat what I just said? Ma'am, it's okay. You can you can just go on from here. So that's okay. Okay. So a uh, lot of the work that I'll be presenting today, these research results, are the hard work of uh, students and postdoctoral fellows in my group. So I like to start every lecture by showing their um, beautiful uh, smiles and sharing that with all of you. And throughout the lecture, when I describe to you the secrets of the universe that we have unlocked, I'll be crediting the contributions of these um, lovely people that I have both the pleasure and the privilege of mentoring. And you'll recognize at least a few that may look just like you. Uh, there are at least four people here from different parts of India, uh, one from south, one from east, one from west. Um, so I hope I hope you can relate to these students and um, and enjoy the work even more. This is really the fruits of the hard work that I will be sharing today. So the outline of today's lecture is that there will be three parts. First, we'll learn how to discover cosmic fireworks. Then after the discovery, we learn how to characterize them. You know, is the firework that you just, show, just saw, is that just that last a second, a minute, an hour, a day? Is it red or blue or, or um, ultraviolet in color? Um, after you characterize it, after you get all this information about it, then we'll go into the astrophysics. Like, what does this firework actually tell us about um, the universe? What, what have we learned about our universe? So let me begin with a picture of Palomar Observatory. Um, to me, this is heaven on earth. Um, it is a beautiful mountaintop, uh, just 130 miles from where I stay. And you can see many different telescopes here. Uh, there's some small ones, the big, big one in the center. The big one in the center is the 200-inch Hale telescope. And this big telescope was founded by Professor George Ellery Hale. And uh, he had the motto um, that he set for Caltech and for Palomar Observatory, uh, which was make no small plans and dream no small dreams. 
And that is precisely the, the motto of this observatory. Because today I'll take you inside some of the two smallest telescopes uh, in this observatory and tell you what big science these littlest telescopes are doing. So, and the concept behind the science is celestial cinematography. So this is how do you not just take pictures of the sky, you don't just take pictures of stars and galaxies, but you try to make a movie of the universe. So it's about studying the dynamic universe and what changes in the universe. What is that flash of light that may be a billion times as bright as the sun, but only lasts for a few seconds. So how do you make a movie of the sky? Let me first take you inside this dome, which is um, the Samuel Austin 48 inch telescope. So 48 inches <coughs> is the di <coughs> diameter of the mirror of the telescope. And this telescope here is, um, has behind it a camera called this Wiki Transient Facility that makes a movie of the sky in the optical. So it's a very wide field camera. So you can image the whole sky every few hours and repeat that night after night, night after night. So you can see um, how the sky actually changes and what's a new star and discover new stars in the sky. And then this teeny tiny dome that you see here um, is um, uh, an infrared dome. This is uh, in the shape of a clamshell. So the entire top of the dome opens and inside it is an infrared camera. And that's called Palomar Gatini IR. And I'll be showing you some discoveries from this, this telescope as well. So let me show you pictures of what I mean by these cameras that can make movies of the sky. So this is literally three engineers at Caltech that have climbed inside the tube of the telescope. And what they're holding is right at the prime focus is the camera, right? And the camera is the thing that you see on the bottom right here. And each of these are entire wafer scale devices. So any of you have worked with possibly thought about detectors, these are big devices and there's 16 of them and they subtend an area on the sky that is 47 square degrees. So what is 47 square degrees? If you look at, go outside and you look at the full moon, the full moon is, is about half a degree on the sky. So this is about 230 full moons. If you just stack them all in, in a square, in one image, every 30 seconds, we can take a picture of 230 full moons. And every hour, we can image something like 4,000 square degrees. So in about four hours, we actually run out of sky to observe. And we repeat and repeat over and over again so that we can see how things change and make a movie. So here is again the sort of uh, a collage of how <coughs> cameras have improved over the years and how this Wiki Transient facility is actually um, opens up a window that wasn't previously accessible. Now this is in the optical wave bands, right? Invisible light, so the light that our eyes can see. This is from somewhere between about 400 nanometers to about um, 850 nanometers or so. So it's a light that our eyes can see. It's very relatable. It's a visible part of the spectrum. And that is where, thanks to Moore's law and advances in semiconductor technology, we've made a lot of progress in leaps and bounds. Now, I mentioned to you earlier that, um, that I like to look at different wavelengths to try to put the pieces of the, the puzzle together. So in addition to studying the optical light, I also wanted to study the infrared light. Um, now, while in the optical, <coughs> there's all this progress to show, in the infrared, when I joined Caltech in 2015, the biggest infrared camera, so this is infrared is um, uh, cooler light, quite literally. It is, it is um, it refers to the cooler part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And it is a longer wavelength or lower frequency part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So think about wavelengths that are between 1,000 nanometers and about 5,000 nanometers. So for these wave bands, the detectors are above the silicon bandpass cutoff. So you can't use the same camera that you, that you use in the optical wave bands. It's just not, um, so the semiconductors just don't support that. So you have to use different semiconductors that are much more expensive. And because of that, um, the, um, the cameras um, that were available, they're only very small. So we had to come up with new semiconductor technology to try to um, build new infrared detectors. So I'll come to that point as well. 
So now when we take these images of the sky, the first thing we need to do is image subtraction. So let's say I took an image tonight um, from the uh, Palomar 48-inch telescope. Um, that's the image on the left. Um, then I compare <coughs> to the image from last night, which I call my reference image. So I take my new image and I subtract it from my reference image. And some of you may think that when you go out and look at the night sky, it's the same night after night. But the frank truth of the matter is actually it's very, very different. Every second in the universe, there is a supernova, which means a star that has become a billion times as bright as the sun, and it can even outshine its own galaxy that it is in. So in this particular example, you can see this is just a random image taken on a night. You subtract it from the image the night before, and you see this bright point source here. And this is a supernova. This is a single star becoming a, a billion times as bright as our sun. And this only lasts like fireworks, right? I mean, it's it's very beautiful when it when it when it explodes, but it only lasts for a short amount of time. So we need to be able to find these transients and collect all this data across all the wavelengths very quickly. Um, so for this, it's a major computer science challenge. It's a major data science challenge because you're processing very large amounts of data and we need very powerful machine learning algorithms to do this in a fully automated fashion. And once we do that, we are... <coughs> able to discover not one, but thousands of supernovae. So here you see you know, where in the universe we've discovered what type of supernova. So the dots that you see in red are explosions of white dwarfs, white dwarfs that are completely disintegrating themselves. The dots that you see in blue are core collapse supernovae. So these are um, the final states of the most massive stars in our galaxy. So stars that are between 10 and 100 times as massive as our sun. And you can see as time goes, we discover more and more uh, supernovae. And you can see a two-dimensional and a three-dimensional rendition that uh, Christopher and Andy made on this slide. Now let me dive into, um, you know, why push to these longer wavelengths? You know, we already have thousands of discover with visible light. So what is the motivation to, to push to even longer wavelengths when that's much harder from a technology point of view, as I was describing to you earlier? So here I show you a picture from visible light. And you can see it doesn't look very interesting. There is a big dark blob in the middle. So why am I spending so long on this you know, somewhat boring looking picture here? Um, the thing is that if you take a picture of the same part of the sky, now in the infrared, so beyond a thousand nanometers, you see that this is not a boring dark blob in our Milky Way at all. In fact, there's a young star launching a protostellar jet um, in this region, and it is one of um, in an, uh, an excellent laboratory for understanding jet physics um, right here. But the only thing is that the reason the visible light cannot tell you this, show you this beautiful picture is that it gets blocked by dust. So literally dust is stopping us here, right? Because the visible light just scatters off of the dust particles. When you go to longer wavelengths, suppose you have a dust particle, the longer wavelength light can go around the dust particle. So it can actually go past it and tell you what is really hidden in uh, these pockets of a galaxy that are very heavily impacted by dust. And this is true for basically everything inside the plane of galaxies, where you have a lot of stars, a lot of gas, a lot of dust. The only way to study it is through uh, looking at longer wavelength light that is able to go around the dust and show you a picture like this. So coming back to this picture which shows you sort of the size of the cameras relative to the full moon and relative to the andromeda galaxy which i hope some of you will recognize um let's look at <coughs> the infrared problem so when i started at caltech the biggest infrared camera was not even one square degree it could barely fit you know, the full moon in one one pointing um, so I wanted to build, build a camera as big as as, um, as ETF in the infrared. And that was really difficult because uh, we just didn't have the detector technology to do so. So we had to find some, some ideas to work around this. 
And what we did was build Palomar Bettini Island, where we could get that same field of view about within a factor of two. This is a 25 square degree camera instead of a 47 square degree camera. But the way to build this camera was to give up on spatial resolution. Uh, Ma'am, sorry to interrupt, but we are still uh, having the problem just now. Oh, okay. Uh, let me let me just this. Um, yes. Is this better? Yes. Yes. Yes, ma'am. It's good. Okay. So let's let's try this again. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, now with this infrared camera, we were what we were doing was trading field of view for resolution. So let me show you a picture of this um, Palomar Gattini telescope, um, which was you know, inspired by the founder of infrared astronomy, which was Professor uh, Gary Neugebayer. So uh, here you see a picture of a very small telescope. It's only about 30 centimeters. So the telescope is just this back, this little thing that you see at the back. In the front is just the baffle. So it's a very fast beam. So you can, by beam, I mean, if you look at the ratio of the, the, the focal uh, length over the diameter, that's very fast, right? So that's a very small number. So this telescope is able to subtend a very large angle on the sky. So in fact, we can map 9,000 square degrees every two nights to a depth of about 16th magnitude. And we do this by converting the hardware problem of very exp expensive detectors to a software challenge where um, these pixels subtend, each pixel is about eight arc seconds in the sky. So that's much bigger than one arc second. But we can use tricks in software to try to still discover infrared uh, fireworks. Okay. So uh, let's take a look at that. Um, and now let's um, move from, you know, the process of discovering cosmic fireworks to actually characterizing cosmic fireworks. So I mentioned to you it's a data science problem to um, you know, process all of this data quickly and, and identify, OK, in this part of the sky right now, um, there is a firework that all of us need to study. Now, how do we actually go about characterizing? How do we actually build up a, a multi-wavelength picture when at the time of discovery, we only have one piece of information, right? It's either discovered in, with the optical telescope or the infrared telescope. So I mentioned to you that um, um, that um, these fireworks can be very short lived, right? They may disappear in a few hours. So I can't just sit and you know wait um, until the next night at Palomar uh, Observatory and and try to study the firework the next night. The only way to solve this problem of the sun rising, um, which is literally, I mean, it's a problem of the rotation of the Earth and the sun rising, is to make friends with people all around the world. And Vishaka mentioned to you the, the Growth Project. Um, and Growth is an international network of observatories and people um, that lo love to study transients. So let's say um, at 4 AM, we get an alert saying, OK, at this part of the sky, there's this beautiful firework. These are the coordinates. Then we trigger this, this longitudinal study, right? where we just keep moving west so that we can stay in the dark and, and collect data as we go around the globe. So from Palomar, if you move west, well, there's a big ocean, which is a bit of a problem. But thankfully, there's an island of Hawaii, which has the lovely Mauna Kea observatories and some very nice telescopes there that can collect data. And then if you move further west, there's Japan, Taiwan, India, Israel, and Sweden. And in this ring, we are able to collect data for these transients very effectively um, and study them before they fade away. In fact, my uh, partners in India, uh, Professor Varun Bhale Rao at IIT Bombay and Professor G.C. Anupama at um, the Indian Institute of, uh, Sci uh, at, of Astrophysics at Bangalore, um, they built a robotic telescope, <coughs> a new robotic telescope at, um, um, in the Himalayas at uh, very close to HCT. Uh, to study and be part of the, um, this network of observatories uh, to characterize these, um, these transients. And together, I mean, this has been a really fun project. Um, you know, there have been many, many brilliant students that have been part of this. And together, we've written um, you know, several, several hundred papers. 
and um, and this has been so fun that what we actually do to again organize ourselves and and keep track of all of these different transients and all of these different telescopes that are all trying to collect data is we built a dynamic collaborative platform very much like i mean this should remind you of your facebook page right um this is our facebook page where we are trying to discover and characterize transients as we discover them and trigger this network of observatories around the world to collect collect the critical data to study it. This is everything I've said so far is sort of the process of discovery, the process of collecting the data. Now I want to spend the rest of the lecture on the astrophysics. What does all this hard work actually do for you? How does it help you understand and further the mysteries of the universe? So what do we learn? Right? That is a question now we'll focus on for the remainder of this talk. So let me start again with um, backtrack to the life cycle of a star. Right. So how does a star form? You have a, a stellar cloud with protostars that collapses to form stars of all different masses. If you have a small star like our sun, um, the small star will live a long <coughs> life, nearly 10 billion years in, a, in the case of our sun and expand to a red giant, form a planetary nebula, and end its life as a white dwarf. Now, if this white dwarf has a companion, um, then you could get some really brilliant fireworks from a white dwarf. Um, a little bit of matter, and you can get a nova, which is a million times as bright as the sun. A little bit more matter, and you could get a, a supernova, which is a billion times as bright as our sun. But only for select white dwarfs that have the right companions. Yeah. <coughs> Now, for a small, much smaller number of stars, which are very massive, so between 10 and 100 times um, the mass of our sun when they start out, instead of red giants, they become red supergiants. And these red supergiants, um, when they run out of fuel, they live only for millions of years, not billions of years, right? Um, <coughs> so they have much shorter lifetimes. And in these shorter lifetimes, they may end up as a core collapse supernova, which is a billion times as bright as our sun. And the remnant that is left behind, depending on how dense that core is, could either be a neutron star, so which is a, a ball full of um, neutrons here, or if you dial up the density even more, then it could be a singularity in space time, a black hole, no less. And if you go to this third, um, arrow here, you could get absolutely nothing at all. So no remnant. Everything could reproduce, annihilate, and you're left with absolutely nothing. So now let's talk about <coughs> each of these classes of fireworks and what we've learned about them. So let's begin with white dwarf fireworks. And here I'm showing results from the um, Palomar Gatini IR project in the infrared. Um, so my student Viraj um, here uh, made these um, pictures where you can see what are called light curves. So you see brightness as a function of time. And this data just looks like roller coasters, right? It seems like it's just going up and down and it's just crazy. But what it's actually telling you is, the, is what happens when two white dwarfs merge. So when two white dwarfs merge, they dredge up so much material, so much dust, that the light curves show these big dust dips and this sort of structure that you see on the on the right panel here. So, and Viraj has just recently found um, 149 new um, uh, white dwarf merger products called um, our Corona Borealis stars. And this is a fantastic result because now we can get a full census of all the white dwarf mergers in our own galaxy. So this is only um, when two low mass white dwarfs merge. Now let's look at a, a white dwarf that's a little bit more massive. And if the white dwarf is a little bit more massive and it starts to steal material from a companion, the companion doesn't even need to be another white dwarf. You can see that there could be a very brilliant explosion. And that's because the material that's getting dumped onto this very compact star, right? This is what, the, what will happen to our sun um, after it has um, run out of fuel, it, it can no longer burn hydrogen into helium. Um, this is falling on material that is so, um, uh, uh, the material that falls is falling on such a high pressure environment that the surface gravity is so high that it burns. So it burns on the surface of the white dwarf and that's why you get, um, get these white dwarfs to explode. If it's a little bit of material, 
then you'll see a classical nova. And if it's a lot of material, then you'll see a type 1A supernova. And we were talking about the Palomar Gatini IR project, this infrared project, and these, these novae are the brightest things that we see in this data. So these are in our own galaxy. These are all in the Milky Way galaxy. And you can see in the subtraction images, these are the brightest sources in our galaxy. Okay, so you can see the, the A minus B, and that, that's the new star that was in there before, the night before. And then if you say, okay, so where does um, Palomar Gatini IR find its novae? Where in our galaxy do they live? Um, and they live where the stars are, where all the dust and gas and, and white dwarfs actually live. So if you plot novae from the past century, they are distributed all over the map as shown by these blue dots here. But if you look at novae that are discovered specifically in the infrared, right, by opening this new wavelength, um, for time domain exploration, you'll see that they trace all this mass, right? They, they trace all the darker regions in this map. And this answers a long-standing question on what is the rate of classical novae. Uh, many people have wondered this, this has been a you know, 100-year-old problem, and all we needed to do was build an infrared telescope uh, to solve it. And we can now tell that the rate of classical novae is actually about 46 per year. And it is very consistent um, with what um, we expect from the, <coughs> the mass of the stars in our galaxy. So this slide is a bit technical. Let's, let's skip this in the interest of time. But this is wonderful work um, done by my student, Kisho Loy. So let's now move on. Uh, to um, dialing up the density a little bit more, right? Um, to instead of talking about um, uh, white dwarfs, which are um, which have densities of about a million uh, grams per centimeter cube, um, let's dial up the density by nine orders of magnitude. Okay, so let's now talk about neutron stars, um, where you're packing the entire mass of the sun in just about 10 kilometers or maybe 11 kilometers, but not much more than that, okay? Um, so you're packing a lot of material in a very, very small amount of space. So these are the remnants of, of co-collapse supernovae. So now let me bring you back to the animation <coughs> that I hope some of you were playing, paying attention to on the very first slide. This is my absolute favorite um, firework discovery, okay? And for this, I want to take you back five years um, to August 17th, uh, 2017 at 12.41.04 UTC, okay? So it's actually very close to the, the time of the day right now. It was very early in the morning in, in California on this fine morning. And this moment really changed, changed my life. And th this experience I want to tell you about in the next about 10 minutes or so. So what happened in this moment was that these gravitational wave interferometers um, called the LIGO interferometers in Hanford, Washington, Livingston, Louisiana, and Burgos in Italy, and they saw this, um, this faint trace, okay, which was a very, very long <coughs> chirp in their data. And what they saw was that they, at this point, you know, the Nobel Prize in in physics, um, uh, the discoveries were made of, you know, these big, massive black holes merging <laughs> to merge. So it was a big surprise that, um, you know, there was something here that was taking nearly, um, you know, um, half a minute or, or actually this actually extends all the way down to minus 100 seconds. There's a very long lived chirp. And what we were witnessing happening in, in, in real time here was two neutron stars spiraling towards each other and merging. <clears throat> and right when they merged and formed a black hole, they launched something. They launched something relativistic, so much so that just 1.7 seconds later, so this is the chirp now sort of cleaned and um, you know, the noise removed from it. And right when that merger happened <coughs> and the black hole was born, about 1.7 seconds later, there was a burst of light in the gamma rays. And this burst of light was picked up by two satellites um, 
the fermi satellite and the integral satellite in space so now gamma rays are the highest energy photons the most energetic photons and just this moment even before i tell you anything else right we were seeing information from two different messengers we saw gravitational waves from this neutron star merger and now we were seeing electromagnetic waves from that same merger this had never happened before we had never seen gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves from the same source. So this was an opportunity unlike anything else. And I mentioned to you, you know, we have all these data science pipelines and all of these different things that are trying to understand cosmic fireworks. So when this happened, the, the cell phones of all the members of the growth collaboration rang at the same time. And a computer basically informed us that whatever we were doing, we needed to jump out of bed and get to action and trigger every single telescope to try to find and understand this flash of light that was just, just seen associated with this gravitational wave event. So we began the search to find the true home of the merger. Now, both gamma rays and gravitational waves are very powerful, but they don't tell us exactly where this happened. So we were searching and searching and searching to find out exactly which galaxy and which part of that galaxy did this firework happen. in. And much to our um, um, happiness and much to the entire world's happiness, we were able to identify the home of the merger as this galaxy, NGC 4993. Uh, which is a lenticular galaxy, and we could figure out the exact position of the transient in this in this galaxy. So once we had nailed the position, right, now we, we knew when something had happened, a black hole was born, and we knew exactly which galaxy it happened in. This set off the most majestic follow-up campaign in the history of, um, of time domain astronomy. We started to collect data with every telescope, about 70 telescopes um, on the ground and seven telescopes in space started to collect the data. And as I explained to you, right, as the Earth rotates, the sun sets, you can start to collect data as you just move, keep moving westward um, longitudinally. So you can see as the night, night is falling, your different telescopes are lighting up and collecting data. Now, those of you with a keen eye will notice that, you know, the red dots are following nighttime, but the green dots are lighting up even during the day. Um, so uh, let me leave that as a homework problem, as you know, which wavelength of light actually doesn't care about <coughs> night and day and what telescopes are lighting up in green that can observe in the daytime as well. So any case, once all this data was collected, what did we learn, right? So uh, the growth collaboration um, put together all of these results in just three weeks. Um, we didn't sleep for those three weeks very much at all. And we wrote these three papers in the journal Science, um, which were heralded as the 2017 breakthrough of the year. The two main questions that we were able to um, make progress in understanding were nucleosynthesis, which is, you know, where are the heavy elements formed? OK. So now um, if all of you, I hope, have seen the periodic table in your chemistry classes. Um, so in, as far as the universe goes, most of the universe is quite simple. It's just hydrogen and helium you know, formed during Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And that is the bulk of the material in the universe. Um, now, um, the supernovae <coughs> that, <coughs> that we were discussing of the two types, um, they form all the elements in the light blue and the dark blue here, right? But depending on whether it's exploding white dwarfs or exploding massive stars. Now, until about five years ago, um, and somewhat embarrassingly, um, we did not know where half the elements in the periodic table heavier than iron were formed. Um, we theoretically thought that they should form when two neutron stars merge, but we never seen two neutron stars merge. So we never actually seen direct proof of all the elements that are shown in yellow here. And um, we had never seen them actually being formed. So when this event was discovered in 2017, it was our first opportunity to test this idea that was proposed back in 1974 by Latimer and Schramm that are these heavy elements actually in fact produced when neutron stars merge? And 
it, much to our surprise, it was um, the data was was completely um, um, you know slam dunk evidence that we could see um, these heavy elements form. What we saw was a firework unlike anything else we had seen before. So the first thing we saw was that anything in the ultraviolet, the hottest, bluest emission, that crashed in a few hours. The optical emission in a few days. And then this longer wavelength infrared emission, that lasted for a few weeks. OK, so that's this, this thing on the top here. So we were seeing a transient that was very too bright and blue at early time and very rapidly reddening at late time. So this rapid reddening was a key signature. And in fact, if you if you take <coughs> the light and you disperse it um, through a prism or a grating, and then you can see the intrinsic spectroscopic signature of the transient. And these spectra are the chemical thumbprint of the transient. And all these bumps and wiggles are actually proof that the heaviest heavy elements were being synthesized in this data. Um, in fact, I mean, the reason um, you, you may ask, you know, so why are um, why are um, heavy elements making the spectra so red or um, causing this very rapid reddening in the spectra? And the simple answer to that question is that the heavier the element, the more places the electron has to go. Right. So if you remember from your chemistry classes, there's the S shell, the P shell, the D shell, the F shell. And if you're a lanthanide, you're starting to partially fill that F shell. Right. So you have so many <laughs> possible line transitions. There are possibly millions of places that that electrons can jump. So when the light is trying to come from the neutron star merger to the telescope on Earth, it is very easy for it to get distracted by all these different line transitions. So the only emission that's able to come out of it is emission that is uh, immune to that high bound bound opacity. So the reddest emission. And so that's why we see <coughs> this very rapid reddening as a hallmark signature of heavy element nucleosynthesis. And now the question is, <coughs> which of these heavy elements form? You saw a lot of elements in yellow. Um, was it um, only, you know, sort of the, the lightest of the heavy elements, you know, elements between sort of atomic mass number around 80? Or was it elements with atomic mass number around 130? 200, you know, you may, if you know your periodic table, you'll recognize, you know, silver is in this peak, gold and platinum is in this peak. So we all want to know, you know, which of these elements were formed. Were the precious elements also formed or was it only the more common elements um, that we know and use um, formed in this case? And the best clue we have for this sort of the reddest emission, I told you the red emission is, is the, the critical signature here. Um, we have images, pictures from the uh, Spitzer Space Telescope. And you can see, if you look at this image, you'll say, I don't see anything there. But when you start to subtract, when once you start to peel out the different layers of the galaxy, you see this red dot here. And if you subtract the entire galaxy, you see uh, the light from this um, neutron star, neutron star merger. And this light that we see which is 43 days after merger, long after we expect any light, unless it is coming from the heaviest elements, which have longer radioactive half-lives and um, a longer sort of beta decay um, lifetime, um, is our only clue that the heaviest of the heavy elements were indeed synthesized. So quite literally, we did strike gold, right? It's not just a metaphor. It's, it's, it's very literal here. And in fact, um, something like 10,000 Earth masses of material, heavy elements were synthesized, and maybe about 10 Earth masses of that possibly could be in gold. And the eight elements that dominate at the latest time are circled in, in red here. And now with the James Webb Space Telescope that was launched um, just a couple of months ago, uh, we have an opportunity to understand exactly which element was synthesized by taking the light at this very late time and dispersing it and getting spectra in the, in the mid-infrared for the next time we discover neutron stars merging. So this to me is, I mean, everything that we learned from the center of the electromagnetic spectrum, right? We've solved this mystery of just understanding where elements that we know and use every day um, understanding where in the universe um, are they actually formed. Now I'd like to move to the other extremes of the electromagnetic spectrum. So the really high energy gamma rays and the really low energy radio waves. 
and what they tell us about this, this majestic um, black hole birth that we just saw. So I mentioned to you that um, just 1.7 seconds after the merger of the, um, the two neutron stars, there was a burst of gamma rays. <coughs> By seeing a burst of gamma rays and not a gamma ray burst. Why is that? Because if, if in fact, um, you were looking at a gamma ray burst, a jet that is typically referred to as a gamma ray burst, and you're looking down the barrel of the jet, it should be really, really bright. The galaxy that um, that hosted this neutron star merger, NGC 4993, it's in our backyard. It is only about 40 megaparsec away. It's very, very close to home. So if we were in fact seeing a gamma ray burst from this, this, so, this source, it should blind us. But it turns out that actually the emission that we saw in the gamma rays was a factor of 10,000 weaker than the ordinary gamma ray burst. So even though it happened so close to home, we didn't get blinded by the emission. Okay, So it was clear that we were not looking down the barrel of the jet. The question then was, could we be looking you know, slightly off axis um, from the jet? Or were we looking you know, wildly off axis? So if you were looking slightly off axis, if the Earth, the telescope was here, and the jet was here, and you were looking slightly off axis, that could explain why the gamma rays were weak. That could explain why your gamma rays were a factor of 10,000 weaker. But if you were wildly off axis, if the Earth was somewhere here, that would explain why the X-ray and the radio emission took nine days before we could actually detect it. Because it took much longer before we could detect the X-ray and radio emission. So this doesn't make sense, right? The Earth can't both be slightly off axis for one telescope and wildly off axis for the other telescope. There is only, so far, only one Earth and all our telescopes are on or around the same planet. So uh, we should not have two different lines of sight. So it was very confusing because all these models that people had for gamma ray bursts were just not working. And these two surprises <laughs> in the emission were not self-consistent. So we were not able to explain them with the same existing set of models. So what we had to do and what the growth collaboration did um, uh, was to try to come up with a new model that can explain all the clues and all the different pieces of the puzzle that we were seeing. So the simulation that you see here, uh, which was made by graduate student Or Gottlieb, um, working with Professor Udi Nakar at Tel Aviv University, you can see on the left panel here is um, the energetics, and on the right panel you see kinematics. So left is at tracing energy, right is tracing velocity. But it's actually not just velocity. It's a little bit um, deeper than that. It is for velocity. Because um, remember, what we, are, what we are working with now is relativistic material, right? Mat things that are moving very close to the speed of light. So you can see here <coughs> in that, um, the dark purple is a Lorentz factor. Uh, so you're about, uh, let's look at fraction of speed of light. You're at few tenths the speed of light in the darker color. And you're more than 0.99 times the speed of light in the yellow lighter color, right? So you really are very, very close to uh, the speed of light here. And so what this is telling you is that when the two neutrons are spiraled towards each other, they were ripping up so much material that the, the environment in which the black hole was born was not pristine. So when the black hole was born <coughs> and it launched this, this jet, Initially, the jet could have been Lorentz factor of 100 and ultra relativistic, but this jet very quickly transferred energy into the surrounding material, which was a material that was ripped off when the neutron stars were merging. And when it transferred energy into the surrounding material, it formed this wide angle, mildly relativistic. It's only 0.99 times the speed of light, not 0.99999 times the speed of light. And this mildly relativistic cocoon, which was wide angle, which you see in this sort of butterfly cocoon pattern here, that is what broke out, right? So if something is wider angle and lower speed, so mildly relativistic, it gives you um, gamma ray emission that is a factor of 10,000 weaker. 
And even more importantly, when this mildly relativistic cocoon breaks out, by the time it gets to the interstellar medium, interacts with it and produces X-ray and radio photons, it just takes a little bit longer than a narrow, very fast jet, right? So it naturally explains the delay in the X-ray and the radio emission. But what is amazing is that because it is moving slower and it takes longer to for the X-ray and radio emission, it means that this X-ray and radio emission will last for hundreds of days. So everything else we were talking about was like hours, a few days, you know, weeks. Now the X-ray and the radio emission from this mildly relativistic jet can last for nearly for more than a year. And in fact, we are still detecting <coughs> this event so many years out from um, the actual merger in these um, two extremes um, of the electromagnetic spectrum. And what this means is that, you know, in terms of the, the fate of the jet, both the jet and the cocoon survived, right? So we are able to see emission um, such that if we had a friend on an alien civilization that could look down the barrel of the jet, that we were not just not slightly off axis here, then they would be able to see um, an ordinary gamma ray burst. Whereas we, because we were you know, not exactly aligned up with the jet, we were slightly off axis, we are seeing this burst of gamma rays instead from the cocoon. Okay, so um, with that, um, let me um, conclude with the last few minutes on black hole fireworks, okay? So these are fireworks that involve um, a neutron star black hole merger. Well, the neutron star fireworks also involved a black hole because it was the birth of a black hole. Now we're going to talk about a neutron star merging with a black hole. OK, um, so until about 2019, until April 26, 2019, these sorts of systems were not known. They known to exist. They were, again, purely in theory land. We had seen two black holes merge. We had seen two neutron stars merge. Now we were taking one neutron star and one black hole, and we were seeing them merge. And once again, there were these gravitational wave alerts, extensive searches. But in this case, there was nothing there to find. There was no electromagnetic emission. No matter how hard um, you know, various students and postdocs looked at the data, which how um, what um, depths they, they went to. Uh, for this one event, it was very well localized. Still, there was absolutely nothing there. So in this case, what we were seeing was possibly the neutrons are being swallowed whole by the black hole. Okay. So what I mean is, if you're in the in the example that we were just discussing um, for several minutes from 2017, you had two neutron stars merging, uh, spiraling towards each other, merging and forming a black hole. But there was so much material that was thrown out that that was giving lighting up the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Now we have a neutron star and a black hole. And if the black hole is very massive, if the black hole in this case was nearly um, 10 times more massive than that neutron star, as the two spiral towards each other and get closer, the entire neutron star falls into the black hole. So there is no material, no ejector thrown out that can be used to um, light up the electromagnetic spectrum and see photons and understand our process nucleosynthesis and see heavy elements that are formed. Sort of next challenge, like how do we push our detectors to be sensitive to a ubiquitous, luminous, and long-lived infrared emission from the formation of neutron star black holes? Um, the current detectors are not good enough, not sensitive enough to, to solve this problem. So we are building even more sensitive detectors. And in fact, um, just in June of last year, we installed a new telescope at Palomar called the Winter Telescope. And we're going to be putting this infrared camera there in April of this year uh, to try to look for neutron star black hole emission. And there'll be a sister telescope in Australia at Siding Springs also you know, on this quest to find um, neutron star black hole merger um, emission. And if even that is not <coughs> enough, <laughs> Um, then we want to push all the way down to Antarctica, where the night sky is a factor of um, 40 darker than anywhere else on Earth. Um, and darker sky means even more sensitivity for our telescope. 
So we want to build an infrared telescope in Antarctica um, to look for emission from neutron star black hole mergers. But we want to solve this mystery. And, and now, you know, this, this is the time to, to solve it. We know they exist. In some cases, sure, the neutron star may be swallowed whole by a black hole. But in other cases, the neutron star may just be tidally shredded by the black hole, which means we might see heavy, the heaviest of the heavy elements form in very, very large quantities. And what we see in on the Earth for the distribution of various elements might finally make sense if there was more than one site where these heavy elements were produced. So this is a mystery that um, at least I'm very determined to solve in this decade. And um, we are overcoming some different, you know, sort of technology challenges right now um, to make this happen. And so I'm lucky to work with some very brilliant um, you know, engineers at, at Caltech on this problem. And <clears throat> once we discover these neutron star black hole mergers, we'd like to use the James Webb Space Telescope uh, to study them and characterize them. And uh, there's also the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope that is supposed to get launched um, in uh, by the end of this decade, which will be uh, also open our eyes to you know very infrared sensitive um, uh, phenomena such as neutron star black hole mergers. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you all very much um, for um, your time and attention today, and I'd love to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, ma'am, for such an interesting and insightful talk. And indeed, our uh, dynamic universe is a place with cosmic fireworks. And uh, stars explode and send out beckons of light that are much, much brighter than our own sun. And uh, fire generated in these explosions are synthesized uh, most of the elements in our periodic uh, table. And this is just so fascinating to know that we are in the universe and the universe is within us. So. And I was particularly amazed by the growth telescope uh, covering uh, the planet, all around our planet. So also thank you so much for enlightening us about your work and how is it shaping the future of sciences. So uh, we'll be taking some questions now. The first question is from Priyanshu Jena. Uh, the question is, we know elements are formed inside stars. But we also know that our sun and all eight planets are formed about at the same time. So how all the elements were already available from the beginning? No, that, that's a wonderful question. Thank you. So um, so when these elements are not formed, on Earth, right? So we go to the mines on Earth and we find these elements, but that's not where they're actually formed. So what happens is that if you have to go back in time to when we can't form on the planet, they formed, so let's say there was a neutron star, neutron star merger in our galaxy, it formed a black hole that means all of these elements in the periodic table. And these elements then got mixed up in, in that protostar cloud, right? In that cloud of material that then collapsed to form our sun and all the planets around it. So the material from these neutron star mergers went into the cloud that formed the sun and the rest of our solar system. And a tiny, tiny fraction of that material landed up on Earth, right, in the mines on Earth that we actually get it from. So you have to think about sort of what the actual production site is and not where you, the last place where you get it, right? You may go and buy potatoes from your neighborhood grocery store, but the potato actually grows on the field in, in, in a farm, right? And, and so we are trying to find that field and the farm where the potatoes grow. Thank you so much, ma'am. Dushab, you are mute. You're on mute. Rishabh, you are on mute. Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. So the next question is from Sahil Sharma. Does the ZTF have the maximum coverage area of all the telescopes on Earth? Yeah, that's another excellent question. Um, so the Zwicky Transient Facility it has a field of view. It has a camera with the, the widest angle field of view on Earth. It is 47 square degrees. That is the biggest camera that anybody has ever built. Um, so, and that's why it has really opened up a new window into understanding the optical um, uh, optical dynamic universe, right? Um, we are now building something called the Rubin Observatory, uh, which is a big national international project. Um, it will only have a 10 square degree camera. So it's a smaller camera by a factor of five, but it will be on a bigger telescope. 
So the telescope, instead of being 1.2 meters in diameter, it will the telescope will be six and a half meters. So it'll have a larger collecting area. Um, so the, there are two things that decide sensitivity, right? One is a camera field of view, which is the biggest for ZTF. The second is how big is the collecting the photon bucket that is collecting the light. So there are efforts now to improve the size of the photon bucket. But um, in terms of the camera field, yes, it is 47 square degrees is the record right now. <laughs> Okay. So, uh, like SDSS has the uh, data release sets, how often does uh, the ZTF release the data in sets? Oh, every, uh, so as soon as we discover a transient, within seven minutes, we send it out to the public. So, <laughs> it's seven minutes later. <laughs> okay. um, and uh, the in detailed images, sort of the, you know, higher level products, the, the, the processing, that may take that there is you know sort of every two months there's a release of all the images as well if you want to get to the data but if you just want to know where the transient is you have to wait seven minutes from when we take that image and you'll know where the transient is okay uh thank you so much ma'am so the third question is uh, from triloki vanshre uh he says uh what is the difference between a white drop and a brown drop and what exactly a tz uh is a TZO? Yeah, excellent question. So, um, so let's go to the first part, which is white dwarf versus brown dwarf. So, the white dwarf is basically um, what will happen to our sun in ten billion years, right? So, in ten billion years, the sun will form a red giant. It will throw out all this material, and the center of the sun, the core of the sun, will will collapse inward and form this very dense thing called a white dwarf which is supported by two things, right? One is gravity in an inward pressure, and the outward is a quantum mechanical force called electron degeneracy. It's basically electrons can't be packed too tightly together. So they're forcing you to sort of give you an outward pressure when you're trying to pack them so closely together in a white dwarf. So that's that's a white dwarf. It's something about like the mass of the sun packed in something the radius of the Earth. Now, uh, so it's a very compact object at the end of a star's life. Now, brown dwarfs, on the other hand, they are sort of the lowest, they're sort of what is in between a planet and a star, right? So our definition of a star is when hydrogen fuses into helium, it forms, its, it, it's able to shine like a star, right? And that can happen down to masses even smaller than the sun. You could have uh, masses that are smaller and a little bit smaller than the sun, like a fraction of a solar mass and you'll still see a star. But once you get too low mass, you are getting into the planet regime, then you, you can't burn hydrogen. You may be able to burn deuterium, which is okay for a brown dwarf, but think of brown dwarfs as, the, as, the, as a kind of star in between a planet and a, and a normal uh, star that shines. And TZOs, I think that's a little bit more involved. It's um, that's, um, a more fun concept. It's a tonic curve object. Um, that is something that Professor Kip Thorne at Caltech um, invented. He's a Nobel Prize winner. And the idea behind that is um, a common envelope in evolution. So the idea is that you actually um, uh, actually uh, merge things inside the envelope of a neutron star. So um, I can give an entire lecture on that on a different day. <laughs> we surely love that, ma'am. We surely love that. In fact, we'll be keeping one topic, one separate topic for that then, for the other time. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. So the next question is from Deepika, and she's asking, uh, have we discovered all the natural elements in the universe? What is the possibility that cosmic fireworks could produce elements that we do not have in the periodic table? Ah, lovely question. Um, so I think we have now, now the situation is better than it was five years ago. I think we have a good guess on where most of the elements are made. But even now, the heaviest of the heavy elements, you know, we have these two data points, um, which are not enough, not satisfying enough to say, okay, we know exactly whether all of them were synthesized and whether they're synthesized in the right quantity. So I'd say that um, we've made good progress, but uh, the quest is still on, right? I mean, we are not. I don't think we have um, solved the mystery entirely, right? Is that is this the only place where heavy elements are made? Are there other places that heavy elements could be made? How much is made in which location? Is it made in the same ratio as we see or not? Or is it a different ratio? Um, as far as your second question about you know, elements that we don't have on the periodic table, um, I think a periodic table is actually the structure is pretty good um, because we are now, if we go down to sort of the atomic structure level, 
we are going through or, or it covers a set of possibilities um so unless there's a surprise waiting for us on our very um i think we know where um where the periodic table is pretty complete okay thank you so much ma'am for this i think the next question that is coming uh, from shruti desai has also you know i started thinking about this uh, so the question is a nebula could extend uh, hundreds of uh, uh, light years in space if we lived in a nebula how would, would we know oh <laughs> um it would be quite pretty actually if we lived inside a nebula then um uh the it would be sort of you can imagine if you've ever been to you know, something a place very north or very south and you've seen a lot of geomagnetic activity a lot of coronal activity um either like the aurora borealis or the aurora australis if you've seen any of these northern lights or southern lights if you're living inside a planetary nebula you would you would be surrounded by very high excitation lines so i think the sky would be more colorful and certainly you know we didn't invent glasses where we could actually just look at these line transitions and look at a very colorful uh, sky to enjoy that so if some of you have amateur telescopes you might have put these filters at the back of it sensitive to these um, uh, oxygen uh, ionization lines and things if you were inside the nebula you could see that all sky it would be very pretty <laughs> But I'm what sorry. if we lived inside a, a nebula that is giving birth to a stellar nursery? Ooh, <laughs> that would be fun, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, you know, wouldn't want to be too close. It gets pretty hot once the stars form, and they, especially once they start fusing into hydrogen into helium. So you want to keep a, a safe distance, but um, uh, it would be spectacular. <laughs> So, ma'am, the next question is from Walter Brown, and he's asking: In a strict sense, is the James Webb Space Telescope a successor of the Hubble or the Spitzer Space Telescope? Mm, why not both? <laughs> uh, so, I I think of it more as um, a successor to the Spitzer Space Telescope because the wavelength of light that the James Webb Space Telescope is it probes is the infrared. Um, it is um, so. I I really do think that it's a much much um, better to think of it as a successor to the Spitzer Space Telescope. Um, it's just I think the Hubble Space Telescope is better known. We've all seen beautiful images in the visible light that we can relate to. Um, so so that's why I think it's easier to explain that. Ah, oh, okay, you know, if you know you know the Hubble, more people know about Hubble than Spitzer. So in that sense, it is sort of bigger than than Hubble, better spatial resolution than the Hubble. but it, the wavelength regime that it's really pushing the frontier on is infrared so if you know about this with this fellow space telescope that is the better answer uh, for where what it is a success it and the next question i personally wanted to ask mm -hmm. so it's that if betelgeuse undergoes a supernova and our telescopes are not pointed at it would we miss the first few moments of the explosion or would there be a way to know that a supernova is going to occur excellent question rishab so uh, the best way we would know uh, our first messenger when uh, betelgeuse explodes or any red giant or red super giant in our galaxy explodes is actually going to be with the neutrino detectors and we've built extreme we as in the global community not me <laughs> but we as a global community the neutrino physicists have <clears throat> the sensitivity of neutrino detectors many fold so um, the neutrinos will be our first clue to a star exploding in our own galaxy and with these infrared telescopes like palomar gatini ir my hope is that more people get inspired by it and build infrared telescopes in different parts of the world because just one gatini is not enough right because likely this the the supernova that happens in our own galaxy will happen where the stars are which is on the plane of the galaxy which is very very extinct so in optical light you won't be able to see much but in infrared light you'll still see a very very bright star So I want more telescopes like the Tini in all different latitudes and longitudes of the Earth. So that if it's raining at Palomar, that's not <laughs> that's not a good reason to miss people to explode it, right? If there were a few more <coughs> of these in in different parts of the world, then uh, we'll be able to hedge against weather, latitude, longitude. Um, And make sure we don't miss Betelgeuse exploding, and we're able to study it in in all its glory. 
In fact, in preparation for that, um, in, I have a student on Palomar Gatini IR that's looking at the red supergiants and seeing how they vary. So not just Betelgeuse, but all the all the stars and seeing how it varies. Is one showing signatures about to explode? So let's let's pay more attention to it. Uh, but we don't want to miss a supernova in our galaxy. We want to study it in, in all its glory. Uh, it'll be a once in a century event, and we want to really do justice to it. So, ma'am, how much time would we uh, buy uh, after we have detected the neutrinos? How much time would it give us? Um, so, supernovae are, um, are luxuriously slowly evolving. Um, so, uh, the neutrinos will only last for minutes, right? But um, the uh, optical and infrared emission will take hours to start to rise and then maybe even um, uh, 10 days or something before they peak and then months before it fades away. So, we have lots of time, but that early emission, that initial rise, that flash in the pan, that's what we are after, right? That's what we are not able to see when, the, when we discover these supernovae in galaxies far, far away. So even though we'll, we'll, we'll see the supernova at some point for sure, right, in the months that it goes up and down, right? Um, and the flash in the pan, the first 24 hours of the explosion are critical because then it, in, when, that, when it first explodes, it just immediately ionizes everything around it. And that tells us what, what was in the, in the star uh, chemically before the explosion. And it tells us exactly what type of star exploded. So the clues of the star and exactly all the details are in the first 24 hours. Um, so we'll find the supernova eventually. But but for me, that first 24 hours and getting that in the X-ray, in the, in the optical, and in the infrared, and in the UV, that is critical. So we we have to on our nerves when yes. we detect the neutrinos. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. So the next question we have from Abhinav Chaudhary, and I think most of the part you have, uh, you know, you already said, but it's what information neutrinos could reveal about the universe. Yeah. So when a, a star collapses, 99% um, of the energy in that co-collapse supernova is actually carried out by neutrinos. So neutrinos are um, very powerful particles. You know, they don't interact with anything. So they actually, um, if you see the only supernova that we've detected neutrinos from so far is supernova 1987A. It exploded 35 years ago. And even today, people are writing papers about those handful of neutrinos that were detected when the supernova exploded. And that was not even in the Milky Way. That was in a galaxy next door in the Magellanic Cloud um, that the supernova exploded. And there must be... Uh, if you look up the astronom astronomical data system for you know how many papers are published, there must be at least a thousand papers on this one supernova and this one set of neutrinos that we discovered from it. Um, there's a lot of information in um, the flavor of the neutrino that was um, that came exactly what order did we detect it in, what that tells us about the the inherent structure of the star. It's a, okay. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Risha, we don't hear you. You are mute. You're, you're again mute, Risha. Sorry. So we have the last question by Sophie, and she is asking, uh, you would be coming across many young students every other day. So what is one piece of advice you would like to offer to our kids? Yeah. Um... I'd say the most important thing if you want to become an astronomer or a physicist or understand the secrets of the universe, the most important thing is to, to have fun. You know, I, I really mean it. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not cliche to really enjoy it. Um, for me, I mean, okay, I'm a professor at Caltech and all that, and I, sometimes I don't believe it. But um, and, uh, for me, it's really, um, really a sort of um, passion that is turned into a profession. I mean, it's something that I just enjoy so much it is such a privilege to um to have an opportunity to, to unlock the secrets of our universe that um i think we should not miss out why we are doing the science it's, it's not for any other reason it really is for the joy of understanding and appreciating more about the really beautiful universe we live in and and always keeping our eye open for you know the surprises that um, the universe has to offer i'm not i don't have a preconceived idea when i go and set up a telescope and watch it is that I will see, right? But instead, I let the universe tell me what it has to, what colors it wants to reveal today, right? What type of firework it wants to tell me about today. So keeping a very open mind to 
understanding the universe, even if it's not what you thought you set out to find, that's okay. <laughs> Still appreciating it and enjoying it and just having fun with it, right? And pursuing your dreams and, and there'll be ups and downs. It's not it's not just a bed of roses, right? I mean, it is, there, are, there will be ups and downs, there will be challenges. Um, uh, so I think you have to have the strength to, to rebound from those challenges, but all the way, all through the journey, Sort of believe in your dreams and enjoy it. Do it only do it if you enjoy it, right? There's no other reason to to pursue pursue it than the pure fun of learning more about the universe. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much for answering all these questions. And if we have more questions, we'll surely email you the questions. And so on behalf of the Secrets of the Universe and Gurukul Academy. I once again extend very hearty gratitude to Professor Mansi Kasliwan for accepting the invitation and sharing with us her valuable thoughts. Your thoughts have enlightened our minds and have shown us a new path. I would also like to thank all of you for joining us from different parts of the world. It is your love and support that keep us going and inspire us to continue our work. Stay tuned on our channel for more such talks in the coming Saturdays. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. 